Hello everyone and welcome to our discussion on describing data with graphs. Let's start with some uh, review, shall we? Okay, so remind ourselves what a variable is and the variable is just the thing that's basically being measured, right? It's some characteristic, um, it could be a number, it could be a descriptor, but it's just basically something that we're measuring from different objects and usually those objects are people but not always so a simple example hair color right your blood uh, cell count uh, the time it takes for something to fail your income right all these different types of things so definitions an experimental unit that's a fancy word for just saying the thing that's being studied then you've got uh, a, a measurement which is basically the the data that's being collected on your variable, right? So if your variable is hair color, the measurement is just going to be the word that describes it. If um, your variable is income, then the measurement is going to be the actual dollar amount, right, that you get from that. That set of measurements is the data that you can use, and that's either coming from a sample or a population, right? We almost always deal with just samples and not populations. So here's a simple example. Your variable is hair color, right? Experimental unit would be a person. Uh, the typical measurements would be the different types of things you could get for hair color. Another example, your variable would be the time until a light bulb burns out, right? So your experimental unit is just the light bulb. Typical measurements would be in hours, right? So there'd be those those numbers. So how many variables have you measured? Well, univariate means you've only measured one thing on each experimental unit. So if you were just going to collect everybody's hair color, that would be univariate data. But if you decided to collect their hair color and their eye color, let's say, that would be bivariate. Or maybe you wanted to collect their age and their hair color, right? That would also be bivariate. Let's say you wanted to get age, eye color, and hair color. Now you've got multivariate, i.e. anytime you have three or more measures on a single unit. If for light bulbs, right, you uh, did the time until they failed and their price, that would be bivariate. If you did time until they failed, price, and um, manufacture, there's multivariate. Okay, so types of variables, two specific kind of general camps. They're either qualitative, which is basically just descriptive things like hair color, eye color. Quantitative, which basically measures an amount, right, a quantity. And if they're quantitative, they're either discrete or continuous. Discrete basically means there's gaps in between them. Discrete data is usually counted. If you're asking the question, how many, like how many siblings do you have? Uh, how many TVs do you own? How many times a week do you eat out? Those are all discrete data values. Continuous are measured. So if you're asking to measure someone's height, measure someone's weight, uh, measure the time it takes until a light bulb fails, right? Those are all continuous. You can think of continuous variables as usually not having gaps between them, meaning that you can measure them to more precise and uh, more precise uh, measurements, right? So you don't have to stop at a whole number, right? You, when you count number of siblings, is either one, two, three, four. But when you measure something, you can have three feet, but then you can have three and a half feet, then you can have 3.6575 feet, right? So your decimals can go on and on forever um, with continuous data. So the true definition, right? Measure a quality or characteristic. So you can say qualitative quality. Right. Some simple examples. We've seen hair color, type of car, gender, uh, the state you were born in. Quantitative is the stuff that we're more used to. It's numerical things, right? Quantities. So discrete, finite or countable number of values. Continuous if it can assume an infinitely many values. So that's what I was talking about where you can measure it as precisely as you want. So the more precise you get, the more decimals you can have. And therefore, there are an infinite number of numbers, right? We all know that uh, when we talk about continuous numbers, there's an infinite number of numbers between 1 and 2 with all those decimals. Simple examples, each orange tree in a grove, that's quantitative discrete, right? For a particular day, the number of cars entering a college campus, right? So you're counting the number of cars. You can see again, it's discrete.
time until a light bulb burns out. Quantitative, continuous, right? Because you're measuring time. So what about graphing these things? If we want to graph qualitative variables, we really don't have a lot of choices. We have some 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 good ones, right? But um, when you have qualitative variables, you really only have measurement, or I'm sorry, uh, descriptors. And all you can do is like count up how many people had brown hair, count up how many people had blue eyes, count up how many males you had, count how many fields you had, right? So it limits to how you can describe that stuff um, in a graph. So again, with qualitative, you really only have frequencies, right? How often each value has occurred. And so we talk about those as frequencies, relative frequencies, or cumulative frequencies are really the three ways. So frequency is just literally how many they have. Relative frequencies is just how many they have divided by the total. So it's a percentage. So here's your raw data. Then you kind of shuffle things up so you can count them properly then you can put them in a table, right? So you, the tally just means you're like doing tick marks to figure out how many you have. Then you write those as frequencies, as actual numbers. Then if you take those numbers and divide by the total, we had 25 total candies. So you take everything, divide it by 25, and then report that as a percent. And that becomes your relative frequency. And then cumulative frequency, you're just um, accumulating everything, right? So you would do... Uh, blue plus red, but you really wouldn't do cumulative frequency with qualitative data because it doesn't make sense, right? So you would really just do frequency, relative frequency, and you could think of percent as being a third, but really percent is just a different uh, way of describing relative frequency. We all know that 0.12 is the same thing as 12%. Okay, visually, we can do them in uh, bar graphs or pie charts. Bar graphs are basically a visual representation of just the frequency uh, part of the table. So if you look at the frequencies 3, 6, 4, 5, 3, 4, you can see 3, 4, right, 3. So these heights just represent the frequencies. Now the pie chart, it also roughly gives us frequency, but it really gives us relative frequency because each um, pie slice is supposed to represent the percent of the whole, right? So this is almost a full quarter, so that's 24%, and so on and so forth. Um, they're great ways to see uh, ratio. However, they're not really helpful if you don't label them, right? If you didn't put these percentages in there, most people would look at this and they would have no idea what percentage orange is or blue is. I mean, they would say, well, that's roughly a quarter, right? But by labeling them, you know that brown and red are the exact. They're both 12. And yellow and green are the same. They're both 16, right? So you really got to make sure you would label these things properly. Otherwise, they're not uh, that helpful. Okay, how about graphing quantitative variables? Well, um, a quantitative variable can be graphed a bunch of different ways. It can be graphed on a pie or bar chart, just like before, because if you have quantitative variables, you can still do counts, right? You can still count up how many things had a certain quantity, and then you can still do relative frequencies, so you can still do bar charts and pie graphs, um, but you can do so much more with quantitative data, data as well. So here are some examples where a hamburger costs different values in different places. So you could do a simple bar chart showing the cost, right? And so the height now represents cost. You can have a time series where you can look at the change over time of a certain thing. So um, this is a time series for I guess a, a, C, a consumer price index over time starting in September and you can see it went down to December and then back up. So that just gives you an idea of how much things have changed and usually when you do things over time you'll do a line graph like this or what's called a, a time series chart. Dot plots. <clears throat> now the simplest graph for quantitative data is a dot plot and all it is is it, it, it counts up how many things you have. So you put a dot for every uh, piece of data that falls into that category. So that's why we have two dots for five, one dot for seven, one dot for six and four, and that's it, that's our dot plot. Stem and leaf plots are similar to a dot plot in that we can see the distribution, but we get a little bit more information. So you divide each measurement into two parts, the stem and the leaf. The stem is in the column with a vertical line, and then the leaves go off in one direction, 
um, the leaf is basically the set of the last digit of your number and the stem are the first one or more digits. Normally we only do this with two digit data, normally things from 10 to 99. But you can do it for bigger numbers and then just know that the leaves are always just the ones digit, right? The ones place, the last digit in your number. So here's the typical way of doing it with two digit data. You look at that and you can say, well, the smallest number we have is 40, the largest we have is 90. So our stems have to start at 4 and go to 9. Then we only had a 40, so we only need a 0 with a 4. We didn't have any 50, so that's blank. And then in the 60s, we had a 65, right, a 68, a 60, and so on and so forth. Now what you would normally do is you would write these all in order. So you wouldn't do 580855. You would go 0 and then 555, five, five, and then 88, eight, right? You put them kind of, you order your number from smallest to biggest, basically. So um, you can see where all these numbers come from, and then you would reorder them and put them from smallest to biggest. And then now, if you tilt your head sideways, you can see that this looks just like what a dot plot would be, right? These, If these were just dots, you could then see that there were more 70s than anything else. So it gives you all the information of a dot plot plus more. That's why it's better. OK, interpreting graphs. We've got two different types of graphs, location and spread, or basically measures of center and measures of spread. So location and spread, we look at these things and go, what does that tell us about our data? This is a fairly symmetrical, right, bell curve-y thing, fairly symmetrical. This one is skewed to the right because it has a long tail to the right, and this is skewed to the left because it has a long tail to the left. So when the data is centered, well, sorry, where the data is centered and how does it spread, that's what we can get from these graphs. So like we said, mostly symmetrical, right? We talk about those as being uh, kind of uh, bell curvish. This one is skewed right because you get large outliers out to the right. See, that's what these are, they're outliers because they're, they're, they're kind of oddballs, they're only by themselves. And then outliers out here, so skewed left. This is called bimodal, because you have a mode here, right, where you have a lot of things. And then you come up here, and you have another mode up here where you have a lot of things. So if you have more than one peak, it's called bimodal. If you have more than two peaks, you just call it multimodal. Just a bunch of vocab, who cares? You can also look for outliers and strange and unusual things. So you can see that, yeah, it's skewed to the right, but maybe they're not really outliers because they're close enough, right? If if this was a if these were all empty, and there was a gap, and there was just one all by itself, then we consider that to probably be an outlier. See, like that. <clears throat> okay, here's a simple example where you have a quality control process, measures the diameter of a gear using a machine, right? They record 15 diameters, and um, in, inadvertently you make a typing mistake and you put in probably 1891 when it probably should have been <clears throat> 1991, right? 1 1.991. So when you measure it, you can see on the graph that this thing is all by itself, most likely an outlier that tells you, oh, hey, better double check things. And that's a typo. And so you can catch that and fix it. Okay, a relative frequency histogram. You'll notice that for quantitative data, we use a bar graph. For qualitative data, we tend to use histograms. So first you want to create intervals, kind of figure out how you want to lump your data together. Then you stack them into those intervals. Then you basically create bars to represent those intervals. And that's it. There's your histogram. It's that simple. So you divide the range into 5 to 12 sum intervals. There's really no rule that says it has to be 5 to 12. The idea is you just want to look at the overall range of your data and then divide it up into equal um, measures um, and then cut it up that way. So like if your data ranged from 0 to 100, it would probably make sense to break everything up by tens, right? Go 1 through 10, 11 through 20, right? All the way up to 91 through 100. If your data went from 1 through 20, you might do them in uh, you know, sets of 5, 1 to 5, 6 to 10, and so on and so forth. So it really comes down to um, how wide is your range. So once you figure that out, right, you round everything up, you um, 
they say to use the method of left inclusion, which means whatever your class is, whatever your range is, you include the lower endpoint, the left endpoint, but not the upper. Again, there's no hard, fast rule on this. You could do right inclusion if you want. You just can't do both. Left inclusion just seems to be kind of more standard. So then you create a table to, so you can kind of do your tally work and figure out um, how many things you have in each uh, frequency, in each class, and then go from there. So the height of the bar represents proportions, right, because we're doing a relative frequency. We could also do the same thing with just a regular old frequency histogram. We just wouldn't be doing relative frequencies. We'd be doing normal frequencies. Um, the probability that a single measurement uh, drawn at random for the set will belong to that class or subinterval is the same thing as the proportion, right? If 25% of your data is in the first class, the first group, then there's a 25% chance that any data value is in that set. So you can see that percentages go with probabilities hand in hand. So we look at this example and we go, oh, well, high value 70, low value 26, that gives us our range. So we take that and we divide it up by six. We're gonna do um, 70 divided, sorry, minus 26 divided by six and we get 7.33, so that's the minimum class width. So we don't obviously wanna do a class width of 7.33, so we're going to round up to a convenient class width of 8. If it was me, I'd probably make it 10 and just, you know, go from 20 to 80, that type of thing. So six class of length, 8 starting at 25. So 25, to, so you can see 25 to 33 and see how it's less than 33. So that means if somebody was 33 years old, they would go in the second class, the 33 to 41 range. So this is what they mean by left-hand inclusion. We include the lower bounds of each class. We do not include the upper bounds. So then we do our tally marks, right? One, two, three, four, slash for five, one, two, three, four, slash for five. So we can keep track of how many we have in each group. And then we take those and we take the, the tally marks and we make them frequencies, right? We just go, okay, that's a five, that's a 14. Then you can divide them by the total number, which was 50, which gives you percents. And then you can go down there and make a relative frequency histogram. You also could have made just a frequency histogram where the heights would be five, 14, 13, and so on. And strangely enough, or maybe not strangely enough, the histogram would have the exact same shape. Okay, so what does the shape tell us? Eh, it's roughly symmetrical, maybe a little skewed, right? You know, because it's kind of uh, trails off to the right a little bit more than it does to the left. What proportion of the tenured faculty are younger than 41? Well, you could easily just add these, right? So that's um, about, oh, I don't know, 5 out of 50 and 14, right? So that gives you 19 out of 50, so it's about 38% and so on and so forth. Right? There you go. Okay, some key concepts that were covered with this. How data are generally generated. So all the vocabulary about what the things are, the types of variable we have, the different graphs we have to represent these things. Whether it's quantitative or qualitative, how we can describe them, and then the different uh, types of information we can get from those graphs. And that is it, folks. That's all we need to know about this section.